The lava from Oregon's underwater volcano will never touch land, but the energy it just released will. The eruption at Axial Seamount acted like a depth charge under the Juan de Fuca plate, sending a pressure wave of seismic energy racing toward the coast. That wave just hit the locked Cascadia fault line. According to new sensor data, it did not bounce off. It was absorbed. The fault is now ringing like a bell, and the vibrations are causing micro-fractures along its most vulnerable points. How can an eruption 300 miles away be the final trigger for the largest natural disaster in American history? And what did the fault line do in response that has every seismologist on the west coast sounding the alarm? Axial Seamount sits silently beneath the Pacific Ocean, 300 miles off the Oregon coast, rising nearly 3,000 feet from the seafloor. Unlike the dramatic cone-shaped volcanoes that dominate our popular imagination, this undersea giant is a shield volcano with a broad, gentle slope covering an area roughly the size of Portland. At its summit lies a caldera, a volcanic depression formed when the magma chamber below emptied during previous eruptions. What makes Axial truly remarkable is that it is one of the most active and closely monitored submarine volcanoes on the planet. Since 1998, scientists have documented major eruptions in 2011, 2015, and now in 2023. Each time, the volcano follows a predictable pattern, slowly inflating as magma accumulates beneath its surface before dramatically deflating during an eruption. The Juan de Fuca Ridge, where Axial sits, marks a boundary where tectonic plates are pulling apart. This divergent boundary allows magma to rise from the Earth's mantle, creating new oceanic crust as it cools. It is part of the global mid-ocean ridge system, the largest continuous volcanic feature on our planet, stretching over 40,000 miles around the globe. Dr. William Chadwick, a volcanologist with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory, who has studied Axial for decades, notes that what makes this eruption different is not just its magnitude, which exceeds anything previously recorded at Axial, but the directional nature of the energy release. Previous events expelled energy vertically. This one generated an unprecedented lateral pressure wave. The monitoring system at Axial is a marvel of modern science. The Ocean Observatory's initiative maintains a network of seismometers, pressure sensors and hydrophones connected by fiber optic cables to shore. This allows scientists to observe volcanic activity in real time, a capability that proved crucial when the recent eruption began. Historically, submarine volcanoes were poorly understood due to their inaccessible nature. But Axial has become our window into this hidden world. The volcano has taught us that undersea eruptions do not just affect their immediate surroundings, they can influence geological systems hundreds of miles away through complex energy transfer mechanisms previously unrecognized. The Cascadia subduction zone represents one of Earth's most formidable geological features, a 600-mile fracture where the Juan de Fuca plate dives beneath the North American continent. This boundary stretches from Northern California to British Columbia, running parallel to the coastline about 70 to 100 miles offshore. For 325 years, this fault system has remained locked, accumulating enormous tectonic stress. The Juan de Fuca plate continues to push eastward at roughly 40 millimeters per year, but friction prevents it from sliding smoothly. Instead, the continental shelf compresses like a spring, storing potential energy that will eventually be released in a catastrophic earthquake. The last major rupture occurred on January 26, 1700, a date preserved in Japanese tsunami records and Native American oral traditions. That magnitude 9.0 megathrust earthquake generated a tsunami that devastated coastal villages across the Pacific Northwest before crossing the ocean to strike Japan's shores. Geological evidence suggests the Cascadia Fault ruptures on average every 300 to 500 years, 
placing the region squarely in the time frame when another event could occur. Dr. Chris Goldfinger, a leading Cascadia researcher at Oregon State University, explains, what makes the current situation so concerning is that we are witnessing a stress transfer mechanism that was not previously factored into our hazard models. The fault is already at its breaking point after three centuries of strain accumulation. Any additional stress input, especially one delivered as suddenly as this volcanic pulse, significantly increases the probability of triggering a full rupture. Subduction zones like Cascadia generate the planet's most powerful earthquakes. The magnitude 9.1 Tohoku earthquake that devastated Japan in 2011 and the magnitude 9.3 Indian Ocean earthquake that caused the 2004 tsunami both occurred at similar tectonic boundaries. Cascadia has the potential to match or exceed these events. The current understanding of the fault's locked zone, the section where plates are stuck together, shows particular concern for the southern portion off Oregon, where the locking appears most complete. Coincidentally, this is the same region now receiving the most direct energy transfer from axial seamounts eruption. The geological relationship between axial seamount and the Cascadia subduction zone represents a critical vulnerability that scientists have only recently begun to understand. Both features are components of the same tectonic system connected by the Juan de Fuca plate that stretches between them. When axial erupts, it creates more than just local volcanic activity. The massive release of energy generates seismic waves that propagate through the oceanic crust. Think of the Juan de Fuca plate as a giant tuning fork. Strike it at one end and the vibration travels to the other end with minimal energy loss. This phenomenon explains how an eruption 300 miles offshore can directly influence the stress state along the continental margin. The recent eruption generated what scientists call a directed pressure pulse, a concentrated wave of energy that traveled through the plate at approximately 4.2 miles per second. Within 18 minutes, this pulse reached the locked zone of the Cascadia Fault. Seismometers across the Pacific Northwest recorded this arrival as a distinctive tremor signature, unlike typical earthquake activity. Most concerningly, GPS stations along the coast detected small but measurable displacement immediately following the energy transfer. The PNGA station near Astoria, Oregon, recorded 3.7 millimeters of eastward movement, a tiny distance that represents an enormous amount of force when considered across the scale of a tectonic plate. Dr. Harold Tobin, director of the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network, explains, what we're seeing is evidence of ASE ismic slip, movement along the fault that does not generate significant seismic waves. This type of silent fault movement often precedes major ruptures. It suggests that the additional stress from the volcanic energy transfer is already causing portions of the fault to fail. The concept of a volcanic eruption triggering a major earthquake is not unprecedented. The 1991 eruption of Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines was followed by several significant earthquakes in the region. However, the direct energy transfer mechanism between a submarine volcano and a megathrust fault has never been documented with such clarity before. USGS research seismologist Dr. Joan Gomberg notes, the plate does not distinguish between stresses from different sources. Whether it is from gradual tectonic movement or a sudden volcanic energy pulse, stress is stress. When the total accumulated stress exceeds the fault strength, it will rupture, regardless of what caused the final increment that pushed it over the edge. The earthquake swarm that followed the energy transfer from axial seamount presents an unprecedented pattern that has alarmed the scientific community. Within hours of the volcanic pulse reaching the Cascadia Fault, seismic networks detected over 240 small earthquakes ranging from magnitude 1.5 to 3.2, not along the main fault interface, but scattered throughout the upper North American plate. This pattern of distributed seismicity suggests the entire crustal block is responding to the sudden stress change. 
Most concerning are clusters of micro-earthquakes occurring near the locked portion of the fault, precisely where a major rupture would likely initiate. Dr. Emily Brodsky, a seismologist at the University of California, Santa Cruz, who specializes in earthquake triggering, explains that the Sabah seaquake swarms represent the crust adjusting to the new stress state. Think of it like ice cracking on a frozen lake after someone jumps on it. The immediate cracks do not necessarily mean the ice will completely break, but they indicate the system is becoming increasingly unstable. Deformation data from coastal GPS stations reveals another troubling development. Parts of the coastline have begun moving eastward at an accelerated rate. The stations near Newport, Oregon are now recording horizontal displacement of approximately 7 mm per year, nearly double the long-term average. This suggests that portions of the locked zone may be slipping, redistributing stress to adjacent segments of the fault. Ocean bottom pressure sensors have detected unusual uplifting of the seafloor along parts of the continental slope, a potential indicator that the subduction interface is deforming. Similar uplift was documented in Japan months before the 2011 Tohoku earthquake, though its significance was not recognized until after the disaster. Perhaps most concerning is the change in the pattern of tremor activity. Episodic tremor and slip events, known as ETS, are slow regular movements deep along the subduction zone that typically occur every 14 to 16 months in predictable locations. Following the volcanic energy transfer, scientists have detected continuous tremor in regions that were not due for an ETS episode for another six months. Dr. Heidi Houston, who studies episodic tremor and slip patterns at the University of Washington, notes that the disruption of the normal tremor cycle suggests the fault's frictional properties are changing. When established patterns break down, it often indicates the system is entering a new regime potentially one closer to failure. The latest seismic tomography images, essentially CAT scans of the Earth's crust, show evidence of fluid migration along the fault plane. The volcanic pressure pulse may have squeezed pore waters within the plate, forcing them into the fault zone where they can reduce the effective stress, keeping the fault locked. USGS hazard assessment specialists have raised the official earthquake probability for a major Cascadia event from 14% to 22% over the next 50 years, a significant increase that reflects the new understanding of how volcanic activity can influence fault stability. A full rupture of the Cascadia subduction zone would generate a cascading series of disasters unlike anything experienced in modern American history. The earthquake itself would last for a terrifying four to six minutes, with violent ground shaking collapsing structures across the Pacific Northwest. FEMA models estimate that a magnitude 9.0 Cascadia earthquake would damage or destroy approximately one million buildings. Critical infrastructure, including bridges, highways, airports and ports, would be severely compromised. Power outages would affect more than two and a half million households, with restoration taking weeks to months in many areas. The tsunami generated by such an event would reach coastal communities within 15 to 30 minutes, a timeline that leaves minimal evacuation opportunity. Wave heights could exceed 100 feet in some locations, completely overwhelming coastal defenses and inundating low-lying areas up to several miles inland. Dr. Nathan Wood is a USGS research geographer who specializes in tsunami vulnerability. He explains that many coastal communities in Oregon and Washington have populations living almost entirely within tsunami inundation zones. Vertical evacuation structures are limited and natural high ground is often too distant to reach in the available time. The casualty estimates are sobering. The economic impact would be staggering. A 2018 study by the Oregon Department of Geology and Mineral Industries estimated direct economic losses exceeding $82 billion for Oregon alone, 
When considering the entire affected region, including Washington, Northern California, and British Columbia, total economic damage could approach half a trillion dollars. Beyond the immediate catastrophic effects, long-term recovery would present unprecedented challenges. The region's isolation would complicate relief efforts, with major transportation corridors compromised and port facilities damaged. Supply chains would be disrupted nationally, affecting everything from food distribution to technology manufacturing. Dr. Althea Rizzo, Geologic Hazards Program Coordinator for Oregon's Office of Emergency Management, notes that unlike other disasters, where surrounding regions can provide immediate aid, a Cascadia event would affect multiple states and international boundaries simultaneously, stretching emergency resources beyond capacity. The cascade of secondary hazards would compound the disaster. Landslides would block mountain passes and rural roads. Liquefaction would undermine building foundations in river valleys and reclaimed land. Damaged infrastructure would release hazardous materials into the environment. Power outages would disable water treatment facilities, leading to public health emergencies. Oregon's Resilience Plan estimates it would take one to three years to restore basic services to the coast, two to four years to restore healthcare systems, and up to 10 years to complete full infrastructure reconstruction. The region's demographic composition exacerbates vulnerability. Rural counties have higher percentages of elderly residents with mobility challenges, and many coastal communities lack sufficient emergency resources. Communities are not powerless, however. Improved building codes, strategic infrastructure investments, and comprehensive evacuation planning can significantly reduce casualties and accelerate recovery. The key is taking these preparedness measures before the disaster strikes. This is a race against time that has gained new urgency with the recent volcanic activity at Axial Seamount. The recent volcanic eruption at Axial Seamount has fundamentally changed our understanding of how different geological systems interact. What once seemed like isolated features, a submarine volcano and a subduction zone fault, are now revealed as interconnected components of a complex system capable of cascading failures. The energy pulse from the eruption has already been delivered to the Cascadia Fault. The additional stress cannot be withdrawn. What remains uncertain is whether this will be the final trigger that initiates a catastrophic rupture, or merely another increment of stress in a system that continues to approach its breaking point. Dr. Thomas Heaton, Professor Emeritus of Engineering Seismology at Caltech, offers this perspective. He says geological systems do not announce their intentions. The fault does not know if it has been accumulating stress for three years or 300 years, it simply responds when the stress exceeds the strength. What is clear is that the volcanic energy transfer has pushed us closer to that threshold, perhaps significantly so. The scientific community continues to monitor the situation with unprecedented focus. Every tremor and every geodetic measurement, every seafloor pressure reading is scrutinized for signs that might provide advance warning of a major rupture. But the reality remains that the Cascadia subduction zone could rupture with little to no warning at all. For residents of the Pacific Northwest, the message is clear. Preparation is not optional. From household emergency kits to community evacuation drills, from retrofitting vulnerable structures to hardening critical infrastructure, the time for these measures is now before the fault delivers its final devastating message. If you found this information valuable, please subscribe to Earth Attacks for more in-depth coverage of the planet's most pressing geological threats. Your support helps us continue our mission of translating complex science into understandable warnings that save lives. Share this video with anyone living in earthquake-prone regions. Knowledge is the first step towards survival when the ground beneath us decides to remind us of its power.